So who is Andrei Tarkovsky and why should you watch him? This video is going to introduce you, if you've never seen a Tarkovsky movie, to the master's great works. If you know Tarkovsky inside and out, this video is going to give you a lot of ideas of how to re-watch him and see new things in his work that you've never seen before. So stay tuned for my rundown of each Tarkovsky movie. Coming up next. <laughs> Andrei Tarkovsky is revered throughout the cinematic world. Directors, critics, ordinary moviegoers, a lot of people just love his work for a lot of reasons. I'll tell you something interesting. I sat down and watched each of his movies, seven feature films, each one every day for a week. I also watched it on a huge screen. I went into this project thinking, well, I sort of like Tarkovsky, some of his stuff, other stuff I find too long and too boring. But watching these movies in chronological order was one of the greatest art experiences of my life. I really can't even tell you what it means to watch Tarkovsky. You feel like the guy is bearing his soul to you. And at the end of this week, watching all of his movies, I felt like I knew him. I felt like he was my friend trying to communicate to me. That's not a common experience with art, period, certainly not with movies. And I wanted to do this video because I've got a number of people in my life who love film but actually have never heard of Tarkovsky before. Or if they have, they've only watched one or two Tarkovsky films, probably Solaris. In fact, I got a good friend who has a PhD in history. He really loves film. When I told him I did this with Tarkovsky, watched all of Tarkovsky's movies in a week, he asked me, who's Tarkovsky? So I'm going to run through each of Tarkovsky's feature films in chronological order. I'm going to give you recommendations on which ones to start with, which ones to avoid, and until you've watched his other movies. Let's start with the one you could begin with. It's a 45-minute short film that Tarkovsky made as a film student. And although it's astonishing to think that a film student made this, he was actually 29 and had the advantage of his father being a poet and his mother being a literature scholar. The movie is The Steamroller and the Violin. It's a beautiful looking movie with many fabulous shots and yeah, as I said, he's a film student and you can't believe a film student actually made this. The one scene in this movie I need to highlight is when the violin player, the seven or eight year old boy, plays his violin in an alley for this ordinary working class man whom he's made friends with. It's a scene that talks about this concept of resonance, sound echoing and bouncing all over the alleyway. A listener needs to focus and pay attention to hear all the nuances of the sound of the violin as it's played in this alley. It's something that Tarkovsky wants viewers to do as well. Listen, watch, pay attention, and see all the different associations. And I think the magic of art, period, comes forth when we pay attention to what he calls resonance. All right, now time for the first Tarkovsky feature. It's Ivan's Childhood. This is a movie set during World War II. It actually felt to me like it could be during World War I, except for a couple of scenes or technicalities in the movie. It's about a young boy, maybe age 12 or 13, who's a scout, a messenger, a runner at the front lines of World War II for the Russians. He hangs out with three or four of the Russian soldiers, and he does a lot of work scouting for them. The boy would like to fight with the Russian soldiers, but he's not old enough. Later in the movie, we find out that his mother's been been killed by the Germans. It's an unusual movie and that's a war movie but also only has about three or four major characters in it. And you never really see the huge hordes of army soldiers like you do in most war movies. You also rarely see the Germans. I think they show up in one scene. You hear about them, you see them depicted in images. And so this movie is fairly dreamy for a war movie and yet it's harrowingly real. The movie pits heaven and dreams, this boy Ivan dreams a lot in the movie at least four times, against the earth or reality. And this division between heaven and earth, dreams and reality is something Tarkovsky would continually deal with throughout his career. Now Tarkovsky splits heaven and earth, dreams and reality up in this movie. You see scenes of dreams and then you cut to dreams of reality. They're very clearly visually separated. But later in his work, Tarkovsky is going to beautifully and hauntingly mix the two together in shot after shot. So you need to watch Watch for later movies, in fact coming up Solaris I think is when he starts doing this, mixing together the world of dreams and fantasy with reality. Ivan's childhood has a devastating ending that I found to be exceptionally moving. I thought I'd seen all the World War II movies that would move me and make me feel something and that I was pretty hardened to them by this point. Only when I watched this movie and I came to the end, I couldn't help but feel 
deeply sad. One of Tarkovsky's major ideas is the effect of World War II on his generation. He was only, say, 8, 9, 10, 11 years old when World War II was happening in Russia. So very clearly depicting Ivan in the way he does in Ivan's childhood, he's kind of talking about himself, his friends, or his generation. This is something Tarkovsky would do throughout his career. I find most of his movies to be at least quasi-autobiographical. And that's why I said early in the video, you're going to get to know this man if you watch enough of his movies carefully. The second Tarkovsky movie coming out in 1966 is one of the great biopics ever. It's a biopic that contrasts pretty sharply with, I think, the Hollywood biopics of the time. And this film biography is about Andrei Rublev, a great Russian artist in the 15th century. Now, I've already done a nine-minute video on this movie. You should go watch that. I'll just say that Tarkovsky's interest in history and the Russian people is very palpable here. And the question of how does an artist relate to the people, masses of people, ordinary people, people who don't understand art, is all over this movie. It's a quasi-autobiographical work again because you know what? Andrei Rublev has the same first name as Tarkovsky. He's kind of talking about himself in a time of turmoil. And I believe you should watch Andrei Rublev first if you're going to start with Tarkovsky. It's either this one or Ivan's Childhood. I think picking either of these two earlier movies, these are probably the easiest places to start with Tarkovsky, even though this is not the easiest movie to watch. You need to be paying attention and you need to be alert to what's happening. The third Tarkovsky feature is a beloved science fiction classic. It's Solaris. Solaris was Tarkovsky's answer to Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. And while that movie was a U.S. version of the space race and technological leaps, Solaris is a Soviet version, or a maybe better to say a Russian version. And I think even Tarkovsky wants to say a Western civilization version. Because in the, that movie, he's quoting Dante, he's quoting Chekhov, he's going to show you Peter Bruegel's The Hunters in the Snow. The movie is deeply philosophical. It's based on a fantastic Stanislaw Lim novel, which is amazing. You should go read it. And Tarkovsky puts his own spin on it. You know, one thing that he loved to do is show the natural world versus sterile world or a wasteland. That comes up really clearly in this movie, which is his first color feature film. The space station in this movie is sterile. It's studying a planet below that may be alive, may be an alien planet, a giant ocean, that could be sending messages to Russian scientists. But early in the movie, you get a natural landscape, a homestead. And the character, Chris Colvin, who goes from this natural homestead on Earth to the space station, is forced to contrast these two wildly different environments. This is one of Tarkovsky's major images that he will return to over and over again in some of his most important shots in all of his movies. The rural house, the homestead, the place where people go to escape or to be away from civilization, the big city, or huge terrible events like World War II. You could start with Solaris. I would prefer you to start with say, Andrei Rublev, as I've already said. And actually, I'd rather you read the book by Stanislaw Lim first and then go watch the Tarkovsky movie to see what he's doing with it. Not my favorite Tarkovsky movie. It's probably in my bottom two or three. And I'm a huge science fiction fan. But nevertheless, this is a great movie. The fourth Tarkovsky feature film is one of the best movies ever made, in my opinion. It's The Mirror. This is an autobiographical movie of a kind. It's like Augustine's Confessions. And other great classical biographies, another one would be Dante's Divine Comedy, which is a poem that is at once about a man's journey through the universe, but also his autobiography in verse. Well, this movie quotes Dante a few times, including in its final image, and I have no doubt that Tarkovsky is creating a cinematic autobiography of a kind. This movie really doesn't have much of a plot. It's about a man in the present world, say circa 1975, who's reminiscing on his past, on his childhood, on his mother, and again on a rural homestead that he lived at when he was a boy. This movie is at once dreamy and real. It mixes fantasy and history, dreams, hallucinations, and reality reality all together at once. I call this movie a miracle. It's hypnotic. And I find this movie is being quoted by many great modern filmmakers. Martin Scorsese, Terrence Malick, Paul Schrader, you name it, they have watched the mirror and are quoting it. So if you don't like Tarkovsky or don't like this movie, it's great to be familiar with it. 
just for the sake of being a film buff or a film historian. This is a perfect time to pause and tell you I think Tarkovsky is actually creating a cinematic language in his movies. With all seven movies, they sort of all come together and are talking to each other in terms of a symbolic language Tarkovsky creates. And I think as you go through Tarkovsky's movies, you see less focus on characters and more focus on the symbolic language. Let me name a few of them for you so that you can be familiar with his language. One, he loves rain and rain indoors. Two, puddles of water, pools of water, oceans, lakes, or ponds. Three, as I've already said, rural farmhouses or homesteads. Another one is wind through the grass. Lots of milk in Tarkovsky. Bells feature prominently. Wintry forests. Dancing sunlight. Dripping water. Boy, there's water dripping everywhere in all of his movies. Lots of horses, lots of birds lots of dogs, lots of children, scanning pictures, images, or paintings. And then one of the more famous ones is Tarkovsky's fascination with levitation. At least four or five of these movies must feature one image of a character levitating. Oh, last, and there's lots of fire. Images of fire, fire in the rain, fire outdoors, fires being set to houses. What's he up to with all this cinematic language and symbolism? I think there's an idea here that the symbols have meaning in and of themselves, and they create and shape us. There's this idea in this world that we humans give symbols their meaning, we impute their meanings to them. They're just sitting there without any meaning, and then we give them value. What's he doing with all the symbolic language? I think he's riffing on an idea I think is in some religions, particularly I believe in Christianity or Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which Tarkovsky is interested in, which is that symbols create us, we don't create symbols. Symbols give us humans meaning. They exist, they already have the meanings, all the meanings are within them. And so Tarkovsky's characters become more richer people, more, more interesting people as they interact with these symbols in his visual cinematic world. So the next movie and the next three movies in Tarkovsky's life are in the late 70s, early to mid 80s, and they become darker and slower in my view. During this time in Tarkovsky's life, I think he was more agitated by the Soviet Union, the censors. Also, he had difficulties in this next movie, filming it, and a terrible health problems developed out of it. The movie is Stalker. The Stalker, like Solaris, is another science fiction movie based on a fabulous book. The book is by the Soviet-era writers, the Sturgatsky brothers. It's Roadside Picnic, one of my favorite books. You should definitely try to read this. In the movie, three men try to go into a zone. The zone has been created mysteriously by some entity, whether it's aliens or a meteor. Nobody knows, but it's been created. Now it's this fantasy fictional realm out in the wilderness where these guys are trying to find a room that will tell them their inner desires. So you have a stalker who is an ordinary working class guy with an artist and a scientist going out into this zone that is at once illegal to go into but might grant their ultimate wishes. This is a dreamy movie that takes place in a post-industrial world. Tarkovsky loves images of desolation, wasteland swamps, and wildernesses that seem ravaged. That goes all the way back to Ivan's childhood and the idea that human wars create these devastated landscapes. I think in Stalker you have that idea only with industry and maybe Soviet-era industry creating decimation of the land that these guys walk through. Of course, this movie has been used as saying, well, Tarkovsky was prophesying Chernobyl, the Chernobyl disaster in the mid to late 80s, when the nuclear reactor exploded and made the wilderness around it a wasteland. Anyway, Tarkovsky loved science fiction movies. He did history movies. He did autobiographical movies. The man was a master of many genres. So the sixth feature film that Tarkovsky did is Nostalgia. By this point in his life, he had left Soviet Union and exiled to Italy, self-exiled. And in this movie, he's talking about a lot of divides in his life and in the world in the present day of 1983, Nostalgia. The movie is about a Russian artist in exile who has a female translator with him. And they're staying at a hotel and they meet this old cranky Italian man who is thinking about the end of the world. This movie doesn't have a lot of plot in it either. It's like The Mirror. In fact, I would call it The Mirror Part 2 in that it's quasi-autobiographical, dreamy and moody and slower than most Tarkovsky movies that I've mentioned before. I find nostalgia to be great. It's about the divide between East and West, the Soviet Union and Western Europe, between Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism, between the great Russian artists of history and the great Italian artists of history. That's something that came up in Andrei Rublev, for example. And this movie has one of the 
best last 10 to 15 minute segments I have ever seen. If I told you the scenario, you would say it's ridiculous, and yet it is very haunting. Last shot is very poignant as well. And it, this movie is about one of the key Western concepts in all Western literature, art, and philosophy. Obviously, the title being Nostalgia, the wish and longing for one's homeland, the longing for the past or the remembrance of the past, a melancholy remembrance at that. I highly recommend this movie, but I don't recommend it unless you've seen a couple other Tarkovsky movies. The last movie on this list is The Sacrifice. This is arguably Tarkovsky's masterpiece. There are a lot of contenders for that title. I personally prefer The Mirror. The Sacrifice is a great movie in and of itself. I think you could actually start with this movie if you were okay with really, really slow cinema. In this movie, an older man, and this movie takes place in Sweden, is at a summer retreat with his family. They're having a birthday party for him. And during this birthday party, at night, they hear about the beginning of World War III global nuclear war. They hear the jets go by overhead, and then they turn on the TV and hear the horrific news. Well, everyone's distraught in the house, as you can imagine. And so this older Swedish man makes a bargain in the middle of the movie with God. He prays to God and asks God to reverse the whole scenario to end World War III and make it go back to where it was. And if God does that, the man will offer up a sacrifice. I love this premise because it goes back not just to, say, Ingmar Bergman, one of Tarkovsky's favorite movie makers, but also to the Bible, to Genesis, and the Abraham story. You know, Abraham bargaining with God for the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham having to make a sacrifice with his son Isaac as God demands in Genesis. This movie is made while Tarkovsky is dying of cancer. He's going to die very soon after this movie is released. And he puts everything into it. This is one of the most beautiful movies, cinematography-wise, ever made. And some of the shots he pulls off in this, I have no earthly idea how he did it. He is at the top of his game, as it were, in this movie, The Sacrifice. And he brings together all of his ideas, the desolate wasteland, the black and white cinematography, the bodies of water, the trees, the crosses, children, fire. It's all here in this movie. And in a way, I would recommend this movie above his science fiction classics that are beloved, Solaris and Stalker. I think The Sacrifice, along with The Mirror, are Tarkovsky's two best movies. It's a very arguable statement. It depends on what you're in the mood for. But the truth is, all seven Tarkovsky movies are great. They're masterpieces of world cinema and world art, period. So in the comments, let me know, what's your favorite Tarkovsky movie? What's your favorite Tarkovsky moment? And if you've never seen him, what are your questions? Thanks for watching. I greatly appreciate it. Please subscribe to my channel for more great ideas and for my great director series, of which this video is a part. Take care and have a great day.